Adam and his many wives. Before Adam and Eve, there was Adam and Lilith. According to Hebrew myth, Lilith and not Eve was the first wife of the biblical Adam, the first man who ever existed. Adam was created by God himself using the dust of the earth, and Adam was given the duty of naming all the living things that God had created. However, by the time he had finished his monumental task, Adam had grown bored. God then took one of Adam's ribs and created Eve as a partner that would be with him for all of eternity. At least, this is the standard version. There's another version of the story in which Lilith is the first woman created for Adam. But this first woman turned out to be more troublesome than God had intended. And so, he had to do away with Lilith and make a new woman for Adam. This reads like the first divorce in human history. Adam wasn't happy with his first wife and requested God got him a new one. In Hebrew myth, Adam and Lilith started quarreling immediately about their equality. Lilith refused to accept the role of Adam's helper, instead wishing to be his equal partner. She also frequently denied Adam's demands to lie beneath him, and this grew to be problematic for the only man on the planet. Lilith later fled the Garden of Eden by choice, and God had to send three angels to find her. When she was finally discovered, Lilith had taken up residence along the Red Sea and was allegedly copulating with demons. When God demanded she return to Adam and make him happy, she refused. God then punished her defiance by causing Lilith's demonic children to perish and cursing her for all of eternity. Lilith in Ancient History the story of Lilith as Adam's first wife originated in Hebrew mythology, and yet Lilith has been around for over 4,000 years. She has a role in just about every mythology across Europe, Israel, Egypt, and Old Mesopotamia. However, to trace Lilith back to her beginning, we need to visit Babylon and ancient Sumer. Her name is the biggest key to her past. Lilith comes from the Sumerian word Lilithu or Lily, which to the Sumerians translates into a female demon. The Lilithu was believed to live out in the wasteland of the desert and was particularly dangerous to pregnant women and babies. Thousands of years before the Hebrews started telling stories, and long before Genesis was ever written, desert demonesses were luring pregnant women to their deaths. They were also apparently feeding poison to newborn infants from their bosoms. The Babylonians believed Lilith traveled on demon wings, and they closely associate her with nocturnal birds and the nighttime. Babylonians were so terrified that Lilith would come to kill their babies that they placed plaques outside their doors. One of these plaques was discovered in 1933 in Syria. It was written in the 7th or 8th century BC, and it said, O oh, you who fly in the dark, be off with you this instant. Lilith. It was believed that if Lilith saw her name written on a plaque, she would fear being recognized and be too nervous to go inside that house. Even though Lilith may sound like a terrifying demon who likes to eat children and ruin pregnancies, archaeologists say otherwise. They believe Lilith rose as an urban legend to explain the high rate of infant mortality thousands of years ago. To determine why so many babies died, the ancient Sumerians conceived the story of the Lilithu. It was easier to blame a demoness for the loss of a newborn than to wallow in their own grief. Adam and Eve in History According to the church, Adam and Eve were created as completely formed humans about 10,000 years ago. They had no biological ancestors and were snapped into existence at God's whim. However, not all religious believers think that's true. The issue with the Bible is that the passages are confusing and easy to interpret in a variety of ways. If you know nothing about the Bible and picked it up and started reading, you might have a totally different understanding of it than somebody else. And one of the interpretations of the story of Genesis is that Adam and Eve were not created by magic. Instead, Adam and Eve are meant to represent 200,000 years of evolution in Africa. Some Christian leaders, such as Billy Graham, say Adam and Eve were real people from history. Others, like the theologian Henri Blocher, say Genesis is telling the story of the planet and the evolution of humans through allegory. Not even popular church leaders can agree on what the story of Genesis is even saying. The whole tale of Genesis could just be genealogical science explained in a way that ancient Hebrews were comfortable with. It would be like a modern teacher trying to explain complex historical issues using memes. 
There is a final and extremely intriguing take on the story of Adam and Eve. One interpretation is that they were real historical people living about 6,000 years ago in the Near East. Humans had already spread across the planet. And so, God decided it was time to reveal himself. He came to a pair of farmers known only as Adam and Eve and chose them as his spiritual representatives. If this theory is true, it would make Adam and Eve the first disciples of God as well as the first missionaries spreading the word of our grand creator across the globe, Lilith and the Archangel of Death. Samael is known as the Angel of Death, his name translating to Venom of God. It should come as no surprise that the most feared angel in religious history may have had a terrifying relationship with Lilith, the most despised woman of all time. Samael is an archangel, meaning one of the most powerful of all God's messengers. His main duty is to bring death to humanity wherever God sees fit. He's called the Accuser, the Destroyer, and was the one who brought death to the Israelites when they fled Egypt with Moses. Samael is also responsible for seducing humanity into committing acts of evil. He is supposed to test humanity's willpower to tempt those who would be drawn to sin. Once they are led astray, he then destroys them. In Jewish mythology, Samael's role is a little different. He is seen in some translations of old texts as the prince of demons, who rules all the evil forces of creation alongside his demonic wife, Lilith. Yet again, Lilith turns up alongside evil. Temptation and Expulsion Temptation and Expulsion is a fantastic painting on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel in the Vatican. The piece of art was painted between 1508 and 1512 by the great Italian artist Michelangelo. It's meant to show the story of Genesis, particularly the expulsion of Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden. The work shows a figure in a tree reaching out to Adam and Eve. This figure's legs turn into a serpent with two tails that wind about the tree's trunk. On the other side of the painting is Adam being prodded in the neck by an angel as he and Eve are forced out of the garden. It's an interpretation of how Adam and Eve succumbed to temptation and were driven out of paradise. However, things may not be as simple as they seem in this picture. For one thing, nobody knows for certain who the figure in the tree is. Most interpretations say it's the devil, but some scholars believe it could be Lilith. The figure does have some feminine qualities, and we know Michelangelo was heavily influenced by Jewish Kabbalah. This wildly famous painting may have been Michelangelo's interpretation of what happened at the Garden of Eden. After Lilith left the garden, she returned in the form of a serpent to seduce Eve. Lilith did this out of jealousy and spite, ruining Eden and as a result getting Adam and Eve banished on purpose. This theory would make Lilith the serpent in the garden, not the devil. Do you think the snake depicted in the Garden of Eden could have been Lilith? Let us know in the comments and don't forget to subscribe. Naama. Hebrew myth tells us Adam and Lilith were the first couple and that Eve was simply Lilith's replacement. But according to the Zohar, a collection of stories from Jewish mysticism known as Kabbalah, that's not the entire story. There was a third woman in the picture, and her name was Nama. The story of Nama takes place during a vague and overlooked period in Adam's history. When Adam got rid of Lilith, he got together with Eve, and after they were kicked out of the garden, Eve gave birth to Cain and Abel. After Cain killed Abel, Adam decided he was done with Eve, and the pair separated. The Zohar says they were apart for 130 years. During that time, Lilith came back on the scene and captured Adam's affection. At the same time, Naama showed up and also seduced Adam. The trouble was that both of these women were said to be demons. Adam wound up having an unknown number of demonic children with both of them, creatures some believe could be the mythical Nephilim. Naama is also said to seduce men through their dreams, attaching herself to their deepest desires, and using them to birth more and more demons into the world. Inanna The earliest mention of Lilith can be found in the Epic of Gilgamesh, dated to 2000 BC. It's the oldest epic poem in the world, a story about the mighty ruler Gilgamesh who slayed monsters on his search for eternal life. Gilgamesh was the original action star, the world's first literary hero. Some think he was even the inspiration for Hercules. In the Epic of Gilgamesh, the hero encounters the Sumerian goddess Inanna, who was worshipped by the Sumerians as the overlord of love and war. She was minding her own business in her garden along the Euphrates River when suddenly she found herself besieged by a trio of villains. One of the villains was Lilith, 
who was the first wife of Adam. In typical hero fashion, Gilgamesh rushes in wearing heavy armor, slays the villains, and sends Lilith fleeing into the desert. Asmodeus Asmodeus is one of the princes of Hell, an awful beast with three heads who spits fire and travels around on a dragon with the body of a lion. He's also supposedly the demon whom Lilith joins up with after she leaves Adam and the Garden of Eden. It's said in Jewish mythology that Lilith gives birth to a hundred demons per day. The demon she's having all these baby with is Asmodeus. The whole point of their union is to spawn as many demons as possible to bring chaos into the world. In Christian mythology, Asmodeus is one of the fallen angels who joined Lucifer's rebellion against God. But in the Talmud, an ancient Jewish text, Asmodeus is depicted as the son of Adam and his third wife, Nama. She is the one who seduces him after he leaves Eve for 130 years. What's really interesting about this is we can see how all these different versions of various characters change depending on which ancient script we look at. Asmodeus is always associated with lust, but he has a variety of origins. In the Testament of Solomon, Asmodeus is responsible for driving husbands into fits of desire so that they cheat on their wives and spread chaos. Asmodeus is later depicted as one of the seven lords of hell, responsible for the cardinal sin of lust. Seeing as how Lilith is also associated with demons, the succubus and all things lustful and wrong, it makes sense that she was his consort. Although depending on which ancient script we look at, Lilith was joined with a variety of demons. She was joined with the Angel of Death, Lucifer himself, and also Asmodeus, the lust demon, Lamash II. The first official mention of Lilith was in Summer, in the Epic of Gilgamesh, but there's another connection she has to Mesopotamia. In Babylonian mythology, Lamash II was a minor demon who had been kicked out of heaven for her bad behavior. She was so furious about being banished from the best place in the universe that she went on a spree of terror. She tormented mortals, harmed women wherever she could, and murdered babies. For the women and children of ancient Babylonia, the only way to protect their children from the bloodthirsty Lamashtu was by evoking a different demon, one named Pazuzu. Unlike the demons in Christian mythology, those in Babylonia were not inherently evil. They had good sides and bad sides. Pazuzu was terrifying because he would cause famine and drought and laugh as humans starved to death. Yet he was notorious for protecting women and children. On the opposite end of that spectrum, Lamashtu preyed specifically on women and children. She was a terror, and most scholars believe she was the true inspiration for the demoness Lilith, Lilith's Legion of Demons. Lilith is not the only ancient demoness who terrorized people. She was the worst of the worst in Mesopotamia, but across the world in Japan there was a similar female demon named Yuki Ona, or the Snow Woman. She was believed to appear only in the winter months when it was snowing and cold. She would then prey on travelers who got lost in snowstorms, sucking out their human life force and freezing them solid. She was considered ageless, depicted as having cold white skin and lustrous black hair. Then there is the succubus, the female nightmare demon which visits her victims in the night and sits on their chest to crush them. These demons go back to ancient Arcadia and Summer, feared at the same time as the Lilithu demons. The succubus was unique in that it supposedly took on the form of a beautiful woman, only with bat wings or some other hideous animal attached to her back. And unlike Lilith who tormented women and children, the succubus was more interested in tormenting men. The succubus would attach herself to men as they slept, draining them of their blood and energy until they died while stuck in a horrifying nightmare they couldn't wake up from. Ling Chi Ling Chi was an absolutely horrific practice that appeared in China around the year 900 and persisted through the Middle Ages. The word itself translates roughly to lingering death. It was a form of execution prevalent throughout China, Vietnam, and Korea. It was brutal, so prepare to be disturbed. Ling Chi was carried out with a knife and involved the victim being tied to a standing pole or some kind of wooden frame. The individual would then have portions of themselves removed over a very long stretch of time. Criminals who had done something particularly heinous, something like treason, would have their body parts removed one at a time but kept alive to endure as much misery as humanly possible. 
To make matters even worse, the punishment was typically performed in public. The person would be put somewhere central where other citizens could watch, and then they would suffer the lingering death for all to witness. It was also seen as a kind of double death. Confucians believed that to alter the body was a sin. The individual who suffered the slow death being cut to pieces would enter the spiritual afterlife disfigured. It was believed that by performing Ling Chi on someone, when they died and went to wherever they were going in the spirit realm, they would arrive missing all the pieces removed here on Earth. Tasting Urine To get a reliable diagnosis for a medical condition in the Middle Ages, physicians would taste a patient's urine. The practice started long ago in ancient Greece. It was used by the Romans, and those that practiced medicine kept on doing it throughout the medieval days. They didn't just taste the urine, they analyzed it for color, consistency, and smell. The reason behind the obsession with urine was almost as bizarre as the obsession itself. During the Middle Ages, doctors were not typically allowed to directly examine their patients. It was uncouth for a doctor to take off somebody's clothing, and so there was no realistic way for them to examine a wound or a boil if it happened to be covered by clothing. Therefore, the much more discreet method of tasting pee became popular. If you happened to have a rash on your inner thigh, instead of looking at the rash, you would pee in a cup and a doctor would swish it around in their mouth like they were tasting a vintage wine. And then there was the urine wheel. Doctors had their very own official chart in the form of a wheel that would help them to make the proper diagnosis based on the color of the patient's urine. Taste would typically correspond with a particular color, and this would allow doctors to make a surprisingly accurate diagnosis of what was bothering their patient. Colors ranged from yellow to green, and the same wheel was used regardless of social status. This was the gold standard of medicine up until the 19th century. And like I said earlier, it was surprisingly accurate. It was in the 17th century that the English physician Thomas Willis realized diabetic patients had urine that tasted sweet, like honey or sugar. Gruesome Diseases Medieval people had a lot more misery to deal with than we do today. Most people will experience the common cold in their life, maybe a tooth infection and perhaps a broken bone or two. But in the Middle Ages, disease was rampant and killed millions of people. Poor hygiene, a weak diet, and bizarre ideas on sanitation resulted in everything from the plague to tuberculosis. Some of the most popular diseases in the Middle Ages included malaria, diphtheria, smallpox, leprosy, syphilis, and dysentery. All of these things caused death, and it was all mostly because of weird beliefs on hygiene. If you were a peasant in the Middle Ages, you probably only took a bath once or twice a year. Most people didn't have access to clean water. Medieval folk weren't prancing around in clean rivers and drinking from clear, babbling brooks. They were forced to drink raw mead while they worked all day in the fields instead of fresh water. They had no idea that they were dehydrating their bodies and leaving themselves vulnerable to killer diseases. Then there was the sewage problem. Cesspools were typically shared by multiple families in a community and very quickly began to create health problems during population booms. Everyone would go to the bathroom in the same place, creating a kind of swamp of human waste. There's even the medieval tale of Roger the Raker, who fell through the rotten floorboards of his latrine and drowned in his own cesspool. Finally, hygiene was not high on the priorities list of most medieval peasants. It wasn't until the 15th century that soap was first produced using lime, oil, ash, and flour. But people back then had no idea that washing their hands could prevent disease, and so they went straight from the toilet to the dinner table. Gross Desserts If you were to sit down for a 10-course meal in the Middle Ages, chances are you wouldn't make it through two of them. Eating habits have transformed a lot in the past few centuries, and the meals of yesteryear would be considered gruesome by today's standards. Sure, many meals might seem familiar. Medieval people did eat bread and vegetables, porridge, meat, and even pasta. But they also ate things like roasted swans, cooked peacocks, boiled cats, and spiced hedgehogs. Lacking the kind of entertainment we have today, they even came up with ways to make dinner more interesting. They created something called a living pie, which was a pastry stuffed with live frogs. This would be served at a dinner table to keep the guests delighted throughout the meal. They could eat their pastry, which the live frogs had been playing in, 
and then laugh while they tried to catch the terrified amphibians. Another very popular meal in the 17th century was beaver. It was a particularly favored meal by the Catholic Church because the church declared beaver as a fish. Since the beaver was such a great swimmer and because it was seen as such a tasty treat, the church called it a fish and allowed everyone to eat beaver on Fridays during Lent. Big thank you to Kimberly Basta and Aubrey Roberts for supporting this channel. Left-Handed Prejudice There was some major prejudice against left-handed people in the Middle Ages. The stigma against left-handedness hasn't entirely gone away and has been seen as something borderline criminal and most certainly sinful since the days of the Bible. In the medieval period, being left-handed meant you were disabled. If you were left-handed in school, your teacher would tie your left hand behind your back and force you to use your right hand. And in the Bible, there are over 20 negative remarks made against left-handedness. For example, in Matthew it's written, Then shall he say also unto them of the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Basically, the Bible was saying that anyone who used their left hand would be sent to hell and burned in the devil's unending fire. In the Middle Ages, favoring your left hand could get you accused of practicing witchcraft. You could wind up being burned at the stake just for being born more inclined to your left. As recently as the early 20th century, Italian doctor Cesare Lombroso suggested people who used their left hand were mainly of the savage races or were women. It was only a century ago that a respected doctor claimed civilized men were right-handed while only barbarians and women used their left hands, the wishing column. For the last a thousand years, something very peculiar has been going on at the Hagia Sophia in Turkey. The Hagia Sophia itself was originally built as a cathedral, a Greek Orthodox church in 360 AD. Then when Constantinople was taken over by the Ottoman Empire in 1453, it became a mosque. In 1935, it was transformed into a museum and then in 2020, reverted back into a mosque. The structure is fantastic. It's an excellent example of religious architecture at the beginning of the Eastern Roman Empire. But what we are here to talk about today is something called the Wishing Column and a legendary hole that people have been sticking their thumb into since the Middle Ages. To this very day, tourists visiting the Hagia Sophia make a wish, stick their thumb into the mysterious hole and then wiggle it around a bit. The legend is that if your finger gets wet touching the column, it means your wish will be fulfilled. Either that or you'll be healed of an illness. Most scientists agree the hole is damp because of moisture gathering on the surface of the column. But according to the legend from the Middle Ages, it was all because of St. Gregory, the miracle worker. In the year 1200, it's said the column began weeping healing liquid. Ever since then, people have been making pilgrimages to the alleged healing hole, hoping for a miracle. Mustache Cups Attitudes on facial hair change by the decade, and it's been that way since the beginning of time. Fashions come and go, rules on beards and mustaches are created and broken, and this was even true during the medieval days. But there was one particular contraption that came around in the early 1800s in England, something designed specifically for keeping mouth hair in check. It was a mustache cup designed to keep Victorian men's mustaches dry while they sipped their tea. If you were a dignified English gentleman in the 1800s, you most likely had a mustache. Mustaches were so popular during the Victorian era, the era of civility that came after the medieval days, that men even had manuals, rules, and grooming kits to ensure the perfect facial hair. There was mustache dye, mustache wax, and the mustache cup. The cup was built with a specialized lip near the top that would shield a man's mustache from whatever liquid was inside. It was a huge trend that spread like wildfire through England and even made its way to America. The mustache cup was used all the way until the 1930s when fashion changed and suddenly, the mustache was no longer in season. Groaning Cheese Having a new baby in the Middle Ages was a bizarre affair. In truth, having a baby has always come with its own unique and sometimes disturbing rituals. People used to spit on their babies as a way to protect them from the feared evil eye. Some people used to purchase extremely expensive wedding cakes to christen their babies. But the Middle Ages saw a fad so strange it's hard to believe anyone ever thought it was a good idea. It was called groaning cheese, and it involved passing your baby through a ring of cheese on the day of their christening. It worked like this. A gigantic block of cheese was brought to the family of the baby. 
Then a hole would be cut in the wheel of cheese just big enough to pass the baby through without smearing him or her in the cheese. And that was it. That was the whole ritual. The baby simply needed to be passed through the cheese delicately from one woman to another. People in England believed this was a surefire way to bless their child with good luck and great fortune. Then afterwards, the cheese would be divided up and everyone would have a cheese feast. Terrifying medicine. We've already talked about the gruesome diseases that plagued, no pun intended, medieval Europe. We know most of these afflictions were caused by an ignorance of basic hygiene, but along with strange and terrifying illnesses came strange and terrifying medical treatments. One of the most popular was bloodletting, created by ancient physicians 3,000 years ago. The ancient Greeks believed the human body contained four main substances, black bile, yellow bile, phlegm, and blood. If these four substances became imbalanced, it was believed a person could get sick, and so to cure the illness, the bodily substances needed to become balanced again. To do this, doctors would drain you of your blood. This could either be done by cutting your arms open or covering you with hungry leeches. But even though it was the Greeks who most likely came up with it, bloodletting continued to be a reliable treatment up until the days of George Washington. Some even say George Washington died as a result of complications following a bloodletting treatment. Another favorite cure-all was liquid mercury. Physicians in ancient China believed liquid mercury was required for the elixir of immortality. People died consuming huge amounts of mercury in hopes that they would become immortal. The use of mercury for curing sickness continued into the 20th century. In the medieval days, doctors treated STDs, primarily syphilis, by dosing people with deadly mercury. And yes, the mercury typically killed the patient, the bear leader. One of the more bizarre jobs that could be found in the Middle Ages was Bear Leader. The Bear Leader was a man who literally led bears about the country. It was extremely popular among the Italians and French and was a well-respected profession. To become a Bear Leader, you first needed to find a bear. Once you found that bear, you then needed to tame it. Once you had your tamed bear, you could go from town to town and make money from its performances. Bears were used in a variety of different kinds of entertainment. They would perform mostly in cruel, barbaric, and horribly tragic blood sports. It was called bear baiting. The bear would fight in gladiator battles against packs of dogs or other fierce predators. It was the medieval equivalent of dog fighting, and the bear leader was typically the one who supplied the bears. And although it was gruesome and without a doubt morally wrong, medieval people didn't have much to do. They took whatever entertainment they could get, and the bear leader made a fortune off the fights. Lost Hands and Feet Archaeologists were recently digging in a medieval Portuguese necropolis when they came across three skeletons who had been punished severely. These skeletons, or rather these people, had been relieved of their hands and feet just before they died. Researchers believe the painful severing of their limbs was most likely a judicial punishment that took place between the 13th and 15th centuries. But what exactly the three men had done to warrant such horrific amputations is a total mystery. The three punished men were uncovered along with 94 other skeletons at a large burial ground in the town of Estremos. The three men were engraved side by side, left at the very edges of the cemetery. It was as if whoever buried them didn't want them in the graveyard with everyone else, so they left them at the very fringe. Even more bizarre is that their hands and feet were placed neatly under their bodies, almost like a sick joke. In the 13th century, severe body mutilation was not all that uncommon when it came to discipline. According to Teresa Fernandez from the University of Évora in Portugal, these punishments were applied to individuals who were considered to be wildly dangerous. Thieves and counterfeiters would often have their hands cut off, but the hands and feet together were saved for extreme cases, and that has led archaeologists to believe the trio in the graveyard had been political dissidents. The Bloodless Crucifixion Punishment in ancient Athens was serious. If you found yourself in trouble as an ancient Athenian, you could face a fine, be sent to prison, be publicly humiliated in the stocks, lose your right to participate in politics, or be straight up exiled from the city. If you were found to be a serious criminal, your property could be taken and your house could be burned down. Then there were the executions. The ancient Greeks are still considered some of the most humane people of the old world, 
even executing their enemies in a civilized manner. For example, Socrates was arrested in the year 399 BC and put on trial for impiety and corrupting youth. Socrates was the great philosopher who arguably founded the Western train of thought, taught his radical ideas to kids, and then was executed for it. He was considered a threat to the status quo, and so the politicians of Athens descended into mob rule and sentenced him to die. He was ordered to carry out his own execution. He had to sit down and eat a deadly potion made from the hemlock plant until he passed away. But the Athenians also practiced more barbaric methods of execution. They did something called the bloodless crucifixion. This involved fastening a convict to a wooden board, using iron collars around his neck, ankles, and wrists. He would be put on display, just like in a Roman crucifixion, except he wouldn't have to bleed to death. The executioner would tighten the metal band around his throat until he was strangled. Marco Bragadin Marco Antonio Bragadin was a Venetian military commander who got stuck in the middle of a fight between the Ottoman Empire and the Republic of Venice. These were two major superpowers in the Mediterranean, with Cyprus being the last surviving Christian enclave in the east. It was a major target for Sultan Salim II, who ordered the island to be invaded in the year 1570. The Sultan sent 80,000 soldiers to erase the Christian presence on the island of Cyprus. He took the city of Nicosia, then attacked the city of Famagusta. Marco tried his very best to defend the city. The siege lasted for 13 months. With his mere 8,500 men, he managed to kill about 50,000 Ottoman warriors. It was a major victory, even though Marco Bragadin ultimately lost the city. But the real horror happened after August 17, 1571, when Marco surrendered and was taken prisoner by the Sultan. The remaining Venetians were decapitated and had their heads piled up. Marco had his nose and ears cut off, was dragged through the city, and then skinned alive. It was one of the most brutal punishments that could be given to a person at any time in history. He had his skin peeled from his muscle like a person might peel the skin off a potato. The Brazen Bull The Brazen Bull is considered the worst torture instrument ever devised by the human mind. It was created around 560 BC in ancient Greece at the seaside colony of Agricus. The territory was controlled by a tyrant named Phalaris, a man who ruled with an iron fist. According to the legend, his favorite sculptor showed off a statue of a bull that he had just fashioned from gleaming brass. The bull statue was hollow on the inside, constructed over a fire pit, and complete with pipes and whistles twisting out of it. This was no ordinary statue, but a torture device meant to broadcast the pained screams of the man inside the bull as he was roasted over the fire. First the fire would get going, then the unfortunate victim would be thrown into the bull through a hatch on the top. The bull's brass body would scorch the person inside, and the pipes and whistles transformed his screams into the horrific snorts of a bull. However, nobody is entirely sure if any of this is true. The brazen bull may never have existed, and the whole thing might just be a horrifying story from ancient Greece. In the original tale, the first victim was the sculptor himself, punished for creating such a despicable device, crushed by an elephant. During the Middle Ages in Southeast Asia, it was typical to kill a person by sentencing them to be crushed to death by an elephant. It was popular in just about every Asian country that had native elephants. India was one place that really grew to be enthusiastic about elephant executions. They called it Ganga Rao, and it was just as brutal and unnecessarily violent as you can imagine. The execution involved a person being tied on the ground, their head forced onto a pedestal, and then the elephant stepping on their skull. The immense weight of the pachyderm would be like a hydraulic press, squeezing the victim's brains into a soup. The Moroccan traveler and scholar Ibn Battuta wrote in the 14th century that he himself witnessed a man be ordered to death by elephant. The elephants, according to the scholar, had been taught to cut their victims to pieces with their hooves, which had been encased in horseshoe-like instruments with blades on them. When the elephants were finished stomping and cutting, they would throw pieces of the dead criminal into the crowd with their trunks. Would you rather be crushed by an elephant or eaten by a tiger? Tell me in the comments below, 
and hit subscribe while you're at it. The Gibbet To be gibbeted was to be stuck in a cage and starved to death. Gibbeting was what happened to a criminal when they needed to be made an example of. A person would be put in a cage like a bird, hung up from a post somewhere very public, and then left to die. Even the cage itself was horrendous and cruel. It was a human-shaped cage, so that the criminal couldn't wriggle around or go to sleep, causing immense suffering and discomfort. They would be forced to writhe in horrible agony as their body ached from the misery of hanging in the cage, ate itself, became dehydrated, and cooked in the sun. Experts believe the gibbet originated in the medieval days. We know for a fact the height of its popularity was in England in the 1740s. It only lost popularity after a law in 1752 stated that all bodies of convicted murderers were either gibbeted or publicly dissected. The public was far more interested in watching public dissections. That's not to say they didn't like watching people die in cages, either. Up until 1752, gibbeting was a major spectacle. People would crowd around the convict, eat food, cheer, and have little parties. It was enjoyable for everyone, except those who lived near the gibbets, since the stench of all those corpses wafted into their homes and made their lives miserable. The gibbets also clanked and creaked in the wind, like morbid, unsettling wind chimes. Adultery in Ancient Greece Adultery was one of the very worst things a person could do in Ancient Greece. Assault was one thing, violence was another, and thieving was seriously frowned upon. But fooling around with somebody's spouse was considered a vile deed, punished to the extreme extent of the law. For the ancient Greeks, family was everything. Anyone who would disrupt a household was considered a villain, and they could be punished immediately. If a husband were to come home and catch his wife with another man, he was permitted to kill the man on the spot and then was automatically divorced from his wife. She would be publicly shamed and usually exiled. The other thing that really bothered the Greeks was just how sneaky adultery was. It involves subduction and coercion, and the Greeks did not endorse that kind of behavior. If a man involved in this sort of act was not killed on the spot, he could suffer a punishment called rapanidosis. This is when the victim has a radish rudely jammed into… yep, the exact place you're thinking. The punishment was described by Aristophanes and was popular in the 5th century BC. It was also, one would have to imagine, extremely uncomfortable. Silas. The Silas was a bizarre tool used by many different members of many different Christian branches for self-imposed punishment. The Silas is also known as a sackcloth or a hair shirt, and the premise is simple. It was a garment that could be worn underneath the rest of a person's clothes, made from extremely coarse cloth or rough animal hair. This might sound kind of comfortable, but I assure you, it wasn't. Once you've been wearing the Silas underneath your clothes day after day, the pain becomes excruciating. The coarse material very slowly irritates the skin, and mutilates the flesh. Nobody's really sure when these kinds of self-punishment started. Some experts say people have been wearing self-harmful clothing since before written history. It may have been used in prehistoric times as a way to cleanse oneself and make a person lighter. In biblical times, Jewish people wore hair shirts when they were publicly mourning to show repentance of their own sin. Following the death of John the Baptist in the first century AD, the hair shirt became extremely popular with Christians. They went even further and made them even more uncomfortable, adding wires and twigs to really tear apart their flesh as they paid penance for their sins. Almost as famous as John the Baptist was Ivan the Terrible, who also wore a hair shirt in the 16th century because he wanted to die like a monk. Ivan wanted to ensure his soul would go to heaven, even though he had committed horrible atrocities in his life. The Silas was one of the only bizarre ancient punishments people imposed on themselves. Jane McRae's Scalping Jane McRae was murdered in Washington County, New York, on July 27th of the year 1777. She was a young woman about to be married to her fiancé, a soldier who sided with the British during the Revolutionary War. The historical accounts of what happened to Jane are different, and the whole affair is heavily debated by historians. Jane's story has been retold countless times since her death, memorialized in palms, paintings, and even modern novels. Each time her story was told, 
it became a little bit different. Jane was said to be an incredibly beautiful woman. She was the daughter of a Presbyterian minister, she moved to New York from New Jersey, and her family was fiercely patriotic. They supported the colonies during the Revolutionary War, but she was engaged to David Jones, who was a loyalist fighter for the British. During the summer of 1777, the British General John Burgoyne dispatched forces from Canada and fortified them with Native American allies. The British force was a mix of Europeans and Huron warriors. As the Native American soldiers were moving to meet the Canadians, Jane McRae and her fiancé were on their way to Fort Edward to meet for their wedding. Before Jane ever made it to the fort, she was captured by the Huron warriors on their way to meet the British, then murdered and scalped. The exact details are vague. Nobody is really sure why the natives captured and killed Jane, or if they scalped her while she was still alive. Whatever the case, the violent and brutal death of Jane McRae sparked anti-British sentiment throughout the 13 colonies. It was also used by the Patriots to defame the Native Americans and make them look like savages. The Cheating Gambler's Hand the Haunch of Venison is a very old pub in Salisbury, England. Its history goes back at least 700 years, with the first mention of the pub being in the year 1320. The pub is said to be haunted by those who have died there over the centuries. It's also home to a very disturbing relic and a great example of Middle Ages punishment. The relic is an old and withered hand. The story behind the hand is that it was chopped off the arm of a gambler in the 18th century who was caught cheating at a game of cards. Cheating in the 18th century was no laughing matter, and the natural punishment was to remove the hand used in the cheating. These days, the pub is said to be haunted by that very gambler, who allegedly wants his hand back. Vikings in North America in 1960, researchers discovered the remains of a 10th century Viking settlement in Newfoundland, Canada. This place is known as Lance O' Meadows, and it completely changed history. More recently, in 2016, National Geographic announced yet another discovery of a likely Viking site on the southernmost tip of Newfoundland. During excavations, archaeologists found an ironworking fireplace and the remains of turf walls. Although other cultures visited Newfoundland throughout history, including Native Americans and vast quail hunters from Spain, the team was confident Norsemen left behind the remains. The hearth and turf structure are common features of Viking settlements, and nearby evidence shows that the Vikings used a hearth for smelting iron ore, which was likely used to create nails to hold the Vikings' supreme ships together. The history of Vikings in North America is still being investigated, and the extent to which they explored the continent remains unknown. One saga claims an explorer named Thorfinn Karlsefni traveled to the so-called New World around a thousand years ago in search of wealth and prosperity. According to the story, he took the same route as the famed Viking Leif Erikson and settled near Newfoundland. Thorfinn and his fellow settlers got into some squabbles with the local natives who eventually drove the Vikings out of North America and back to where they came from. It's unknown whether this story is true, but the confirmed discoveries of Viking settlements certainly show that it could be. Swastika Floor Tiles During a renovation earlier this year, an Indiana jeweler had the hardwood flooring of his store ripped out, only to reveal swastika-designed tiling underneath. Images of the shocking floor pattern appeared on Reddit's Damn That's Interesting forum in late February. While swastikas are most commonly associated with Nazis and white supremacy, the symbol long predates the Third Reich's twisted ideology. It dates back at least 15,000 years, with the oldest evidence of it being identified on a prehistoric mammoth's tusk. Controversial as it is, it has appeared in many cultures, including Buddhism, Hinduism, Jainism, and even in Christianity, ancient Greece, and the medieval period. And its meaning has varied over time, and based on the beliefs of the different groups that used it, but the swastika was generally a symbol of well-being or good fortune. It wasn't until the Nazis adopted it as their own that it took on the horrific connotations it carries today. The jeweler disclosed that the building dates back to the 19th century, so its use of the pattern is completely unrelated to Nazi beliefs. 
Many commenters agreed that the shop owner likely covered up the tile with wood flooring to avoid being associated with the Nazis, which is completely understandable, all things considered. Ancient Roman Toilet In a study that was published earlier this year, researchers examined a conical piece of ancient pottery, much like many others that explorers and researchers have found throughout the former Roman Empire. The particular artifact in question came from the bathing complex of a centuries-old villa in Sicily. Experts initially assumed that people used this type of pottery for storage, but they kept finding the vessels near public latrines, leading them to wonder if they were chamber pots. Scientists from the University of Cambridge, who analyzed what they described as a crusty material that was caked onto the inside of the pot, recently proved their suspicions. They found the eggs of an intestinal parasite called whipworm, confirming the suspicion that the vessel was a chamber pot and that it once held human waste. The discovery marks the first time scientists have found parasitic eggs in the residue inside a Roman piece of pottery. The team that made the findings hopes other researchers will adopt the technique they use to examine other Roman jars that people may have used for the same purpose. While the only way to tell if a vessel functioned as a chamber pot is to detect intestinal parasites in the material left behind, it's likely that this parasite commonly infected the people of ancient Rome, so this is probably a good way to identify ancient toilets. Da Vinci Drawing In 2016, the French auction house Tajan initially valued a 15th century drawing called Etude pour en Saint Sebastien dans un paysage at somewhere between $21,460 and $32,191. Later that year, they deemed it to be an original Leonardo da Vinci work, and its estimated value skyrocketed to around $16,100,000. Not long after that, French officials declared the sketch a national treasure and banned its owner from selling it. As part of the agreement, the country's cultural ministry had 30 months to buy the artwork. But the sketch's elderly owner rejected the ministry's meager offer of just $10,700,000, 10 million euros, and the ministry withdrew its offer. Once the 30 months had passed, the owner applied for a certificate to sell the drawing abroad. But they found themselves entangled in what the French government claims is an ongoing investigation into allegations that someone had stolen the sketch, leaving the owner stuck in a legal limbo of sorts. At the last update, the owner's lawyer had sued several members of France's cultural ministry, hoping to force them to issue the certificate. Massive Underground City Archaeologists have just announced the discovery of a massive ancient city called Mashiat beneath the streets of Turkey's Mardin province. A cleaning crew discovered a cave that was part of the city during a project dedicated to cleaning and preserving historic houses. Suspecting it may lead to more, archaeologists carry out excavations and found the rest of it. They found an abundance of artifacts dating back to the 2nd and 3rd centuries, as well as water wells, corridors, places of worship, and more. Found beneath the city of Midyat, the subterranean settlement differs from other ancient underground cities that archaeologists have found in the past. According to Mardin Museum director Gani Tarkin, who spoke with the Daily Sabah, he said that Mashiate first emerged as a hiding place for Christians since the religion wasn't official. Worshippers sought refuge in underground cities or formed their below-ground settlements to escape Roman persecution. At its peak, the ancient city was home to about 60,000 to 70,000 residents. Tarkin said that his team plans to expand their excavations throughout the entire district. Temple to Zeus Archaeologists have just unearthed a temple dedicated to the Greek god Zeus on Egypt's Sinai Peninsula, according to the country's Tourism and Antiquities Ministry. The dig took place at the Tel El Farma archaeological site, also known by its ancient name, Pelusium. The site dates back to the late Pharaonic period, and its use continued into the Greco-Roman and Byzantine times, as well as the Christian and early Islamic periods. The excavation team started their dig at two massive fallen granite columns which mark the temple's entrance. They also found enormous granite blocks that worshippers may have used as a staircase. 
Researchers have known about the temple as far back as 1900, when French Egyptologist Zeus Cassios discovered it but didn't excavate it. The Roman Emperor Hadrian renovated the temple during the second century, according to inscriptions found in the area. An earthquake ultimately destroyed it. Who is your favorite god from Greek mythology? Let us know in the comments, and be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. While you're at it, how about a thumbs up so we know to make more videos like these? New Findings on the Roman Financial Crisis By 90 BC, the Roman Empire was in danger of financial collapse. Researchers have long suspected that this was due largely to its excessive military spending and involvement in wars, especially in Italy. But there's a lot that experts don't know about the Roman financial crisis. A group of researchers recently analyzed some of the empire's coinage to learn more about this troubling time. They determined that around the time Rome struggled, its mint started cutting silver coins with a copper alloy. This happened in two distinct stages in the years leading up to 87 BC, at which point the coins contained anywhere from 5 to 10 percent copper. Regarding the debt crisis, Roman statesman Marcus Tullius Cicero wrote that the coinage was being tossed around so that no one could know what he had. Experts were long confused about what that meant, but the new findings shed a lot of light on the statement. From that angle, it appears the Romans placed a high value on their coins being made of pure silver, and that they lost confidence in their currency when the mint began deliberately infusing the money with copper, making it impure. Animated Cave Carvings Between 23,000 and 14,000 years ago, a group of ancient people called the Magdalenians lived in what is now southern France. They carved images of animals, humans, geometric shapes, and more into bone, ivory, and on the walls of limestone caves. Researchers often glean their most extensive insight into the region's prehistoric cultures through these engravings, since other archaeological evidence is scarce. A recent study examined the carvings on 50 plaquettes by using sophisticated computer software to amplify the inscriptions. The team then shined a strobe light on the images and found that it produced an animated effect by shifting the viewer's focus from one animal to another. It made the figures look like they were moving. There's also heat damage around some plaquettes, showing that the ancients probably illuminated them to achieve this effect. People during this time made cave artwork with very little light, relying primarily on the flicker of their torches, according to lead study authors Andy Needham and Izzy Wisher, who spoke with Courthouse News. And now it appears as though they became so adept at working in near darkness that they became experts at harnessing this limited light and using it to their advantage. Ancient Migration Route Thousands of islands scatter the South Pacific. Some of its first human inhabitants were a group called the Lapita, who reached some of the region's most far-flung places as early as 3,000 years ago. Their languages, pottery, tools, and domestic animals spread along with them. But their exact migration patterns are a mystery. For example, researchers long believed that the Lapita avoided Papua New Guinea, presumably because there were already people living there. But a new study shows that they lived on the southern tip of the land mass on what's known today as Brooker Island, the oldest layer of sediment at what's known as the Gutunka archaeological site contains the bones of many introduced species that the Lapita brought with them, including dogs, pigs, and rats. Tools and pottery filled a more recent layer on top of it that is specific to the culture, serving as definitive proof they settled in Papua New Guinea. The items include objects made from obsidian sourced from outside the island, as well as blades that the inhabitants may have used for tattooing. It appears as though the Lapita's presence was sparse and occasional at first, but that they developed a more permanent presence as time went on. Evidence shows that their hunting of sea turtles intensified and that their material culture became more complex as the settlement became more established. Humans have inhabited Papua New Guinea for around 50,000 years. Unlike some places the Lapita settled, they weren't the first people to arrive there. It may be their interactions with other cultures that prompted them to look elsewhere for a place to live. Lead researcher Ben Shaw said that the team found the Gatunka site by a random stroke of luck, along with the local community's help and permission, earning them a distinction 
as one of the paper's senior authors. Underwater Maya City Between 400 BC and 250 AD, during what's known as the late pre-classic period, the ancient Maya people established a settlement at Lake Atitlan in Guatemala. On an islet within the city, the city known as Sambaj comprised housing and public buildings, including temples and plazas. Today, the ruins sit between 39 and 66 feet, 12 to 20 meters beneath the water's surface. Researchers recently looked towards the lake's origins in their search to find out what caused the city to become submerged. Lake Atitlan is volcanic. It appeared around 84,000 years ago after an eruption caused a caldera to form on top of the volcano and fill with water. Experts believe that volcanic activity may have been responsible for causing the settlement to fall into the water. Back when the city still existed, several cultures and Maya subgroups inhabited the area surrounding the lake. Researchers have identified many settlements besides Sambaj. A group of researchers are inspecting the site and have found buildings, ceramics and other artifacts that were previously undiscovered. Their next step is to create a map of Sambaj, which they've determined measures at least 656 by 984 feet. This will enable people to take a virtual tour of a fascinating ancient place they would otherwise not get to see. Sumerian Riverboat Starting as early as 5000 BC, the world's largest city was a place called Uruk, in what is now Iraq. This is where the legendary King Gilgamesh lived, and it may also be where people developed the world's first writing system. In 2018, archaeologists found some black tar or bitumen on what would have been the outskirts of Uruk. It's all that's left of a riverboat that was likely made of reeds, palm, leaves, wood, or some other organic material that has long since decayed. Evidence shows that the boat was roughly 23 feet 7 meters long and 5 feet 1.5 meters wide. It was a good size for navigating Sumer's canals and channels and probably served its purpose well until it sank into a river that no longer exists. By the time someone built the boat around 2000 BC, Uruk was entering its decline. When the boat was first discovered, archaeologists left it in place to avoid damaging it, but it eventually became clear that the sediment it was buried in wouldn't protect it for much longer, so they recently dug it up. It is now on display at the Iraq Museum in Baghdad. The Devil's Rocking Chair Zach Bagan's haunted museum in Las Vegas is a depository for all things weird and macabre. It houses every kind of oddity you can imagine, including haunted objects from around the world. One of these objects proved to be so dangerous that Zach recently had no choice but to remove it as an exhibit. The haunted object is a simple rocking chair. Zach acquired it from the Museum of Ed and Lorraine Warren, a pair of paranormal investigators and the inspirations behind The Conjuring movies. The rocking chair from their collection was the influence behind The Conjuring 3, and it's known as the Devil's Rocking Chair. Zack set the chair up at his own museum in Vegas, making a whole exhibit out of it. But after at least six of his guests experienced negative reactions to the chair, and he himself experienced paranormal activity, he had no choice but to close the exhibit down. It was the first time he had ever done something like this due to an object being legitimately haunted. According to Zack himself, six people all burst into tears and sobbed uncontrollably when they witnessed the devil's rocking chair. One of them even collapsed as if seeing the chair made her faint. Zack also claimed that he experienced the power of the chair firsthand. He became affected, started babbling incoherently, and his friend cried uncontrollably and ran out of his house. Zack's now stuck with a chair that he paid $67,000 for and is too haunted to keep in his haunted museum. Haunted Taxidermy Lawyers Douglas and Tyler Zotarell are the owners of a bizarre shop called The Wild Collection. The shop houses curiosities, peculiar objects, haunted relics, gothic decor, and a bunch of creepy taxidermy. Everything is for sale here, from a taxidermy zebra or lion to a twisted taxidermy unicorn. The unicorn was created by altering a wildebeest head to create a truly disturbing image of a mythical beast. But by far the strangest things for sale here are the haunted items. 
For example, the store has a Nkisi in the front room, a demon vessel enclosed in a glass case. The case is to keep visitors from accidentally breaking the salt circle and touching the shattered shards of the Nkisi, even though the vessel is already broken, meaning whichever demon was trapped inside of it has already been released. It's still too dangerous to let people play with. The demon may have left residue, which can seep into a person's being and cause terrible feelings. There's also a haunted doll here called the Christening Doll. It was supposedly used by parents in Victorian England who lost a child. They used the doll to communicate with their deceased kid, and it's said some fragment of the child's spirit is still in the doll. King Tut's Trumpets After the discovery of Pharaoh Tutankhamun's tomb a century ago in 1922, the team of explorers found themselves at the center of a curse. It was said that any who opened King Tut's tomb and disturbed his eternal rest would be damned for eternity. In 1939, the BBC announced that they would perform a live broadcast playing two mysterious trumpets pulled from the Pharaoh's tomb. One of the trumpets was silver, the other was bronze. Archaeologists are fairly sure they were used by the pharaoh himself to call his greatest fighters into battle. When the BBC said they were going to play the trumpets for the first time in 3,000 years, the British public freaked out. Many people were terrified that when the trumpets blasted, they would usher in a new era of chaos. And in reality, that may be exactly what happened. The trumpets were played live in the spring of 1939. Months later, Hitler invaded Poland and started World War II. The Devil's Footprint The Church of Our Lady dominates the Munich skyline in Germany with its great twin towers. It's a truly massive Gothic church that dates back 600 years. It's a historically valuable piece of the city, a great cathedral from the Middle Ages built in 1488. To this day, it serves as the seat of the Archdiocese of Munich, and it's the burial site of King Ludwig III of Bavaria and the Holy Roman Emperor Louis VI. But there's a much darker history here as well. During construction in the 15th century, the overseer was Jörg von Halsbach. The project became increasingly expensive, the overseer started to run out of money, and it looked like the cathedral may not be finished. Legend has it Jörg van Halsbach then turned to the devil for help. He agreed to eliminate all windows so that the church was a place of complete darkness, if the devil would fund the remainder of the construction. The deal was made, and the devil went on his way. But Jörg von Halsbach didn't hold up his end of the bargain. Instead, he tried to trick the devil. When the devil showed up and looked through the front door of the church, he couldn't see a single window and figured the deal was solid. What he didn't realize was that Jörg had built the tall white columns to block the windows from view. But the ruse only worked for half a minute. The devil, feeling brave, took a step inside the cathedral to get a better look. That was when he saw the brilliant light flooding in through the windows. In fury, he stomped his foot through the floor. That footprint, allegedly smashed into the floor by the devil himself, is still there haunting the church to this day. The Women from Lem Statue In 1878, archaeologists discovered a mysterious statue in Lem on the island of Cyprus. Nobody knows exactly what the statue is, what it's supposed to depict, or who carved it. Archaeologists believe it was created around 3500 BC and that it may have been a fertility idol, perhaps made in the image of an unknown goddess. But it's not the history of the statue that makes it so fascinating. Instead, it's the ill effect the statue has on anyone who owns it. It may be called the women from Lem officially, but most people just call the statue the goddess of death. The very first owner of the statue was a man named Lord Elfont. He acquired it shortly after it was dug out of the ground, but within a handful of years, every single member of his family was dead. The statue then changed hands to a second owner, Ivor Minucci. Within a few short years, his whole family was dead too. The third owner was Lord Thompson Noel, and the same thing happened to him. Within four years of receiving the statue, all his family members were dead and buried. The cycle of death continued without pause, next resulting in Sir Alan Biverbrook, his wife and his two daughters, all dead. 
But before the statue could do away with Riverbrook's two sons, they took the cursed idol and donated it to the Royal Scottish Museum in Edinburgh. Within a year, the museum curator who had touched the statue, coincidentally or not, was dead. Out of all the haunted objects out there, the women from Lem is undoubtedly one of the most dangerous. And yet to this day, it remains behind a pane of glass in the museum, where people gawk at it every single day. At least it can't hurt anyone behind glass. Would you be brave enough to gaze at the Lem statue for more than five seconds? Tell me in the comments below, and hit subscribe while you're at it. Letter the Haunted Doll Letter, short for Letter Me Out, is one of the most haunted dolls in the world. The doll lives in Australia and is shrouded in mystery and superstition. She has very exaggerated facial features, giving her an instantly off-putting appearance, and the story of Letter is just as bizarre as its face. In rural New South Wales about 50 years ago, Kerry Walton explored an abandoned house with his brother in the town of Wagga Wagga. The house was supposedly haunted, and Kerry was curious to see how true the stories were. Inside, he found the wickedly grinning doll. He felt compelled to rescue it, and he and his brother gave it the name Letter Me Out. They named it that after the doll appeared to try and wiggle its way out of the sack they had put it in. Fast forward all these years later, the doll is now officially haunted. It's said to move around on its own accord, going from one room in the house to another without anyone touching it. Scuff marks can be found on the floor, supposedly left by the doll's shoes. Plus, some people who spend too much time in the presence of Letter report feeling sick, emotionally drained, and just generally weak. Nobody's sure where the doll came from or why it's haunted. It seems to be about 200 years old, probably built somewhere in Romania. The doll also has a full head of human hair, which some paranormal experts say could mean it's inhabited by the spirit of a lost child. As for the whereabouts of the doll, it's still with Kerry Walton and his family. Haunted as it may be, Kerry refuses to let it go. The Foot of El Chupacabra there is supposedly a very real mummified foot belonging to the chupacabra stashed in somebody's personal collection of oddities. The foot was allegedly taken in 1994 by a Puerto Rican hunter who came across the beast in the remote Yunque rainforest. He then traded the foot to a farmer who sold it to someone else, and it wound up in somebody's own secret collection. However, we have no idea where the rest of the body is. If there's another foot floating around somewhere, or really what the chupacabra even is. Legend has it the chupacabra was first spotted in Puerto Rico in the 1990s, but it's since been seen by eyewitnesses everywhere from the southern United States down to South America. The chupacabra appears to be spreading, and it has a thirst for blood. What makes the chupacabra a truly terrifying monster is that it sucks its victims dry of their blood, its victims being goats and livestock. There's never been a confirmed attack on a person, only on farm animals. Some people believe the chupacabra is an unknown species of mammal, some kind of dog-like creature or mutant cat. Others believe it could be a prehistoric reptile, but there are even wilder theories that claim it's an alien mongrel forgotten on our planet. Witches in Australia Superstition runs deep in Australian history, especially when it comes to the early settlers. The earliest Australian settlers, from between roughly 1788 and 1935, believed wholeheartedly in magic, evil spirits, and witchcraft. When something bad happened to these people, they almost always blamed it on evil forces. If someone in the family fell ill, if the crops were bad, it was always because of an unseen evil. To safeguard themselves against witches and the whims of malevolent spirits, these early Australian settlers buried magical items underneath the floorboards or behind their fireplaces. Underneath the subfloor of an Edwardian brick cottage in Marrickville, Sydney, a mummified cat was discovered. It was left buried near the doorway to deter any witch from entering the property. But the mummified cat isn't the only creepy object that's been found. At the historic Canterbury Villa in Stockton, a woman's shoe was discovered tucked in the fireplace. In the last few years, there have been shoes, children's toys, dolls' clothing, and hats. Most of the disturbing objects from the 19th century discovered in historic houses. 
The haunted objects were put there because they were seen as human articles. Things like shoes and hats mimicked people and for some strange reason were thought to keep the evil spirits at bay. Many historical houses in Australia also come complete with witch markings, strange patterns scratched into walls, chiseled into brickwork, or burned onto wood. These markings were supposed to work as magical hexes to keep away witches. The Dummerston Vine In Dummerston, Vermont, about 200 years ago, something horrible happened to the Spaulding family. Members of the family began dying at inexplicably young ages. Each newborn Spaulding was afflicted by an unknown disease that slowly but surely sucked the life out of them, like some kind of parasitic life leech. The mysterious illness was almost certainly tuberculosis, which in the early 1800s was often attributed to one supernatural evil or another. The Spaulding family put the blame on a cursed vine. Yes, the vine of a plant. At the local cemetery, the family discovered a vine that had burrowed along the family plot. Each time the vine touched a coffin of one of their deceased family members, another one of them died. They were so desperate to rid themselves of the curse and save the family that they dug up the last body in the row of graves, hacked up the vine, and then burned the body. The family had grown so afraid that they really thought a haunted vine was to blame for the deaths of their young loved ones. Sadly, nothing changed with the destruction of the vine. In the Dummerston Center Cemetery, you can still see where six of the Spaulding children are buried, their moss-covered headstones standing neatly in a row. The Gambler's Hand The Haunch of Venison is a small pub in Salisbury, England. It's supposedly one of the oldest buildings in the city, with the first mention of it being from around the year 1320. With 700 years of history, it's no surprise the Haunch of Venison is considered one of the most haunted buildings in the UK. Visitors say it's haunted, the owners say it's haunted. The general consensus is that the place is filled with ghosts. One of the ghosts is allegedly a gambler, a man who didn't exactly play his games fairly. The story has it that in the 18th century, the gambler was playing cards in the pub when he got busted cheating. As punishment, his arm was chopped off by the resident butcher, and then, for an unknown reason, the owner of the pub kept the arm as a souvenir and mummified it. The unusual object remained stashed in a disused bread oven inside the pub to keep it fresh and to stop it from stinking up the place. The gambler, with his hand forever stuck on display, continues to haunt the ancient pub and torment its proprietors. Which of these creepy objects would you dare take possession of? Let me know in the comments, and thanks a lot for watching. If you haven't yet, be sure to hit subscribe for more awesome videos from the channel. Come back soon, and I'll see you then.